and we're going to be learning the alphabet in chapter 3. Now, I should say that if you have children that are old enough to learn the Greek alphabet, you might enjoy going to my other site, kidsgreek.com, and there's a different way of learning the alphabet, and you kind of learn it together. It's fun. In fact, I have several students that have done that and have told me about it. But anyway, in this time together, we're going to do the more traditional approach to learning the Greek alphabet. What I want you to do is to understand that, in a sense, Greek and English go along for a while together in the alphabet. And then they diverge and they do some things that are different. And then they come back together. They're, in other words, they're similar and they are different as they go through the alphabet. Now, when I say that Greek is following English, understand that I, I know anyway, that English wasn't a language till about ooh, a thousand years ago. And so the Greek's not following English, but for an English speaker, it's, it's helpful to think that way. So as we go through the Greek alphabet, concentrate on where it's similar and where they're different, uh, both in terms of what the letters look like and what they sound like and also the order of letters, okay? There's basically, I, I basically break the Greek alphabet into five units and you will be able to see how these units are the same and different than Greek. I should say something about pronunciation because in these days there's, there's more and more discussion going on about how is Greek accurate, the Koine Greek accurately pronounced and there's, it's, it's, heating up, I guess you could say. It, the, the, the discussion is getting more and more aggressive. What I've chosen to do is to teach what I call standard pronunciation. This is the pronunciation that I was taught. It's a pronunciation that the vast majority of students learn. Uh, doesn't make it right, but it's standard pronunciation. One of the things I like about standard pronunciation is that it creates, it has a different sound for every vowel and consonant. And if you use, for example, modern Greek pronunciation, the same, diff different vowels have the same sound. So I found it just from a teaching standpoint, easier to teach using standard pronunciation. The other reason I use standard pronunciation is that because the vast majority of people use it, it makes it easier for you to communicate with each other. I remember being in a college once where the previous Greek teacher had used modern Greek and then his teachers went to the local seminary and the local seminary taught standard pronunciation and it was, it was really hard for them to communicate. So anyway, I'm teaching you standard pronunciation. It doesn't make it right, but it's what most people do and didactically it makes it a little easier to learn Greek, okay? So we'll do that. And uh, for this particular talk, you may want to download the study sheet from the website because it gives you a, a central place to keep all your notes about the alphabet as we go through it, okay? All right. Well, let's start in the first unit. The first Greek letter is the letter alpha. It's pronounced like in the A sound in the English father. So alpha is as in father. Second letter is the B sound. It's called B. Beta, like in the word Bible. The third letter, there's no C in Greek, so this is where we have the G sound. It's called a gamma. And the gamma is pronounced generally with the hard G sound, like in the English word gone. Now, there's a special situation that when you have gamma that's followed by a gamma, a kappa, he, or xi, so gamma, gamma, Gamma Kappa, Gamma He, Gamma Xi. Of course, you know those other letters yet, so you'll learn them as you go through. When you hit that scenario, the first gamma is pronounced as a gamma nasal, as an N sound. So like the Greek word for angel is angelos, alpha, gamma, gamma, but it's pronounced ang, okay, A-N-G sound. So the third letter is the hard G, generally sound, called gamma. The fourth letter is the D sound. It's called a delta. And so delta is pronounced like the D in the English word dog. And the next letter is an epsilon. It's a short E sound. It's like the E in the English word met. So say those with me, okay? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Okay, say it again. Alpha, beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon. Now, very important little side comment. Did you say that out loud with me? 
Okay. If you didn't, you're in trouble. If you want to learn this language, you're going to have to learn to say these things out loud. The more senses that you can employ, the, the easier it is to learn things, right? So you need to see it, you need to say it, you need to hear it. Okay, you just employ as many senses as you can, all right? And some people are hesitant to talk to themselves or to have other people see that they're talking to themselves. I, I don't have that problem. I, I talk to myself all the time. As a friend of mine once said, sometimes it's the only way to have an intelligent conversation. <laughs> well, maybe not. But anyway, I talk to myself all the time. I'd really encourage you to be talking to yourself. And again, if you're embarrassed about that, then go into your inner room and shut the door and uh, pray and then talk to yourself. All right. So you just you have to be saying these things out loud as much as you can. We're learning a language. This is verbal. OK, so say it with me again. Alpha, beta, gamma. Delta Epsilon. Okay, that's the first of the five chunks where Greek and English are pretty close. In the second chunk in the Greek alphabet, we have some letters that are a little different. Okay, and there's three of them. So there is the Zeta. This is the Z sound, but this is where the Greeks put it in the alphabet. The Zeta is the Z sound, as in the English word days. Now, there is some controversy about how to pronounce uh, the Zeta, even in... Um, standard pronunciation. Some people want it slightly plosive, like a D, Z, Z, Z together. But I teach it as a simple Z sound. I think most people do teach Zeta as a simple Z sound. So Zeta is the Z sound pronounced like the Z in days. The next letter is the long E vowel. It's called an Ada. All right, and uh, I know it looks like an N, but it's uh, not. It's the eta. It's a long E-class vowel, and we have this in English, for example, in the word obey. Okay, so eta is the A sound, as in the English word obey. We think of it as an E-class vowel, but it's pronounced A. Okay, all right. Then the next one in this little short is the theta. Now, there are four letters in Greek that are pronounced with uh, two sounds, uh, like TH or PH or something like that. Well, this is the first of them. This is the theta. It's the TH sound, like in the English word thing. All right? All right. So let's say all of them from the beginning together. Say them out loud. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta. Okay, say it again. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Zeta, eta, theta. Okay, very good. Okay, let's go on to the third. This one's going to be a little longer than the other ones. The next vowel is the iota. It's the short I sound as, well, it's, it can be short and long. And this is one of the interesting things about iota. It's, it's the short I sound as in the first I in the English word intrigue, but it's also a long sound. And when it's long sound, it's pronounced as an E. Again, just think of intrigue. The first I in intrigue is the short iota sound. The second I in intrigue is the long iota sound. Okay, so iota is pronounced I or E as in intrigue. Now, how will you know whether it's long or short? Well, there are some clues that I'll be showing you along the way, but for the most part, just listen to your teacher because that's how I pronounce these letters. I, you'll listen to your teacher say the words and you'll just pick up whether it's an it or e sound, okay? So don't worry about it. Again, there are some clues, but don't, for right now, just be content to know that the iota is the Greek I and it can be pronounced both i and e, okay? Good. So it's iota and then kappa is the K sound. So kappa is pronounced like the K in kitchen. And then there's the L sound. It looks doesn't look quite like an L in English, but it's the L sound. It's the lambda. So the lambda is the L sound pronounced like the L in law. Okay, so iota, kappa, lambda. Mu. Mu is the M sound in Greek, so it's pronounced like the M in mother. So there's mu and then nu, that's the N sound. So the nu is pronounced like the N in the English word nu. But then we have a, 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 another kind of weird letter and we don't have anything that strictly corresponds to it in English. Well, we do a little. It's the C, okay? It's an XS 
kind of sound. It's like the X in axiom. So C is pronounced X as in axiom. Just make sure you swallow your spit before you say it, okay? Okay, well, let's, before we go any further, let's go back and review the last six, okay? So let's go from the beginning. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, now the new set, iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi. Okay, let's do the last six again. Iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi. Okay, well that xi got kind of stuck in there, and then we're going to go back and follow, follow the English alphabet again, okay? The next letter is the O-class vowel. It's the Omicron. So Omicron is pronounced like the short O in the English word not. After Omicron comes P. Now I know if you've learned math, you called it pi, and that's fine if you're learning math, but this is Greek, and this letter is properly pronounced P, just like the English P, okay? So P is pronounced like the P in the word peach, okay, or many other words that have a P in it. Okay, so Omicron, P, and then there's rho. Now, the, the rho kind of looks like an English P, doesn't it? But it's, it's a rho. So the rho is the R sound, like the R in the English word rod. So Omicron, P, rho, and then sigma. Sigma is the S sound in Greek. So sigma is pronounced like the S in the English word study. One of the things that's unusual about this, though, is there's two forms of it. If the sigma is the last letter in a word, it's written in the second form where it kind of goes below the line. If the sigma occurs anywhere else in the word, you're going to have it done the normal way. And so, for example, in the word apostolos, you have two sigmas and they're written the two different ways. So it's just an orthographic difference, no difference in meaning at all. Okay, so omicron, p, rho, sigma. The next letter is Tau. And tau looks just like the English T and is pronounced like the English T. So the Tau is pronounced like the T in the word talk. Okay, after the Tau comes Upsilon. And you gotta, I still remember my German teacher saying this in German class. You gotta kind of stick your lips out to say it is properly because the Upsilon is pronounced just like the German U with the diuresis, the Umlaut. Okay, Umlaut. The Upsilon. Okay, just stick your lips out and say it, all right? So let's look at this last group again. We have Omicron, P, Rho, Sigma, Tau, Upsilon. Okay, we come to the last four letters of the alphabet, so we're almost done, okay? And these first ones are a little different from English. That's why these are the fifth and final grouping. We have the Phi. Okay, which the PH sound, like in the English word phone. So the phi is a f sound, F sound. The next letter, again, swallow your spit first before you say this. It's a he. Kind of make a, a sound of a cat. <laughs> okay, uh, that's the h sound. It's a CH. Uh, if, if you can kind of put a Scottish accent on the Scottish word for lake, it's loch. Okay, loch ness. It's a kind of... Not a really good parallel, but it helps a little, okay? So it's a h sound. So the he is a h sound. So phi, he, and the next one is the c sound. It's the ps sound, like the English word lips, that ps. So you have the c, and you have, then you have the last letter. It's the long O-class vowel. And if you know Revelation, you know that Jesus is the alpha and the... Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet. The omega looks like a W, but it's not. It's a long O-class vowel. And so the omega is pronounced as a long O sound, as in the English word tone. Okay? All right. Well, you should have been filling out your chart, and all the squares should be filled in by now. So let's, again, you can look at your chart right now, but let's walk through it again and be saying it out loud and listen to me, Okay. And, and make sure that you're starting to learn them correctly. Here we go. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Zeta, eta, theta. Iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi. Omicron, p, 
Rho, Sigma, Tau, Upsilon, Phi, He, Psi, Omega. Okay, how'd you do? All right. Well, there's there's stuff on the website you can go to and, and listen to me say those over and over again. Uh, you can also go and listen to my uh, kids when they're about four and six, uh, say them as well. If, if you're wondering who the voices are on the website for the alphabet, it's my children who are now in college, but they were very young when they said that. Okay. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to get any further in Greek until you learn the alphabet. So this is the first thing you need to really learn. But there's a couple other odds and ends. Let me share them with you. First of all, make sure you know which ones are the vowels. Okay. So the vowels are alpha, epsilon, eta, iota, omicron, Upsilon, Omega. So make sure you mark those in your chart or highlight them in the textbook and make sure you can always identify those seven vowels. That's going to be really important. Okay, a couple of other things. There's something called breathing marks in Greek that if a word begins with a vowel or a row, there's going to be a little mark over that initial vowel or row. And that's called a breathing mark. And there's two of them. A uh, first breathing mark is called a smooth breathing mark, and it's like a, a little C, but it's backwards. And so, for example, you would find this on the word apostolos, okay? See that the mark over the alpha, that's the smooth breathing. It indicates absolutely nothing, <laughs> okay? It's not pronounced. It's not transliterated. Uh, there's a history behind it, and it's it, it's an easy thing to learn, okay? But anyway, that's the smooth breathing. It's not pronounced. Uh, it's just there, Okay? But the second, uh, the second breathing is important. It's called a rough breathing, and it's shaped, you flip the smooth, it looks like a regular C. It introduces an H sound. So, for example, if you have the word upair, and then you put the rough breathing on it, you pronounce it hoopair. Okay, the accent's on the epsilon, but it's hoopair. So the rough breathing looks like a C over that initial vowel. And if it's an initial row, it's, or, or actually upsilon, it's always going to be a rough breathing. And it adds an H sound into the pronunciation of the word. Now, if you have a word that begins with a single vowel, and now there's not two vowels in a row, but a single vowel and it's capitalized, the breathing mark goes in front of it. So, for example, Jesus' name is Iesus, all right? So that's the smooth breathing in front of the initial iota. Okay, that's it for breathings. Let's talk a little bit about diphthongs, and I think we're almost done at that point. There are certain combinations of vowels that you can't pronounce easily. Uh, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, so I might as well start it now. There's a thing called hiatus. Hiatus is the pause that is necessary to pronounce two sounds. It's why we don't say a apple, we say an apple. Okay, in English, the N is added to make it be able to be smoother. You don't have to go, uh, apple. Okay, Greeks don't like that hiatus. They really don't like it. And you're going to find a lot of the stuff that happens in the Greek language is in order to get away from having to go, uh, uh and be able to pronounce them smoothly, okay? Well, a lot of times when you have two vowels together, it would take a, a, a sound to say them. And so what Greek does is, and many languages do this, is that those two vowels form a single sound, okay? So when you have two vowels that form a single sound, it's called a diphthong. I always thought it was diphthong, uh, but it's not, it's diphthong, all right? So a diphthong is when you have two vowels that create one sound. And in Greek, the second vowel is always going to be an iota or an upsilon. Okay, so the, the, the first vowel can be a lot of different vowels, but the second vowel will always be an iota or an upsilon. And when you see this, you can be pretty much assured that you've got a diphthong. Well, let me, take a, let me show you the chart, and we'll walk through the pronunciation of all the different diphthongs. Okay, the diphthong alpha iota is pronounced I like in the English aisle, and so the Greek word that I have listed in the far right column is pronounced iro. The diphthong epsilon iota is pronounced a, like in the English word eight, so the Greek word is a, means if, but you say a. The diphthong omicron upsilon is pronounced like the oi in oil, and so the Greek word is pronounced oikia, now, you notice I said oikia. Okay, there's a clue that it's not oikia, it's oikia. 
It's a long yoda. How do I know that? That's how my teacher said it. Okay. <laughs> the fourth diphthong is alpha upsilon. It's pronounced ow, like in sauerkraut. And so the Greek word is pronounced autos. And the next diphthong is the last of the common diphthongs. Omicron upsilon is pronounced oo, like in the word soup. And so the Greek word is pronounced oude. The final three diphthongs are not quite as common, but you need to know them. Upsilon iota is pronounced we as in sweet. And so the Greek word is pronounced huios. You notice know, that's the rough breathing over the iota. Huios. And then the last two diphthongs, epsilon upsilon and eta upsilon, are pronounced u as in feud. So the Greek words are pronounced iothus and euxenin. Okay, last couple things on diphthongs. One is that you've already seen on the word huios. When you have a word that begins with a diphthong, the breathing is over the second vowel of the diphthong. If, in fact, that diphthong is capitalized, it will still be over the second vowel of the diphthong. So that's nice. There is something called an improper diphthong, and that's when you have eta, I mean alpha, eta, or omega, and when it was followed by an iota, the iota subscript, it goes under the long vowel. It's not pronounced, but grammatically it's really important that you notice that that iota is sitting under there. Okay, but those are technically classified as improper diphthongs, but the iota is not pronounced, okay? And finally, there's a thing called a diuresis. Again, you have diuresis in, in other languages as well. A diuresis is the two dots that we put over a vowel to say, we know that these two vowels are generally pronounced as a single sound. They, they form a diphthong. But for whatever be the reason, the second vowel is to be individually pronounced. So we say, we put a, the two dots, the diuresis over the second vowel to say this isn't a diphthong. Is actually two vowels, and what's going to happen is that you'll syllabify between those two uh, vowels. So the the name Isaiah is how you would say uh, the name of the prophet, Isaiah. Okay, all right, not an easy word to say. All right, what I always do at the end of every chapter is is put up a summary and just to remind us what we've learned. Okay, so let's look at the summary right now. Well, we learned the alphabet, and the alphabet is. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, Xi, Omicron, P, Rho, Sigma, with the two different ways it's written, Tau, Upsilon, and then finally, Phi, He, Psi, Omega. We learned that the seven vowels are Alpha, Epsilon, Eta, Iota, Omicron, Upsilon, Omega. And we learned that words that begin with a vowel or row are going to have a breathing mark. The smooth breathing is the backward C. It's not pronounced. The rough breathing looks kind of like a C, and it introduces an H sound into the pronunciation of the word. If the word begins with rho or an upsilon, the breathing will always be a rough breathing. If a word begins with a single capital vowel, the breathing is placed in front of the vowel. And we saw the diphthongs, or when you have two vowels that make one sound, and the second vowel of the diphthong is either an iota or an upsilon. Breathing goes over the second vowel of the diphthong. We have improper diphthongs where the iota has subscripted under a long alpha, eta, or omega. And the diuresis mark tells you that what normally would form a diphthong doesn't in this particular word. Diuresis is normally occur on like loan, foreign loan words and proper names and stuff like that. Uh, not always, but usually. Now, before you run off and do your workbook like you should, uh, let me just say a couple of things about the workbook. And the, this, is, again, is really, really important, the things that I share in class. First of all, do your homework. <laughs> Please do your homework. What will happen sometimes is I'll have students, and, and they've, they've obviously read the, the chapter, and they know the different facts, uh, the different, you know, they know the letters of the alphabet and whatnot, but they can't translate anything. 
See, what the work, and that means they haven't done the workbook. The workbook is the place where you synthesize everything, where you kind of take all the different facts of the chapter, join them with the facts of the previous chapters, and kind of make sense of it together, synthesize all the data. And so it's really important that you do the workbook, that you fight your way through the exercises, use the website when you need help, because without that exercise time, you're not going to really know uh, the Greek language, okay? So make sure you do it. And second of all, you really should treat the workbook as a test. And what I mean by that is this. Read your chapter in BBG, in the grammar. Uh, memorize your vocabulary. Memorize your paradigms or whatever there is in that chapter to learn. Shut it. Put it away. If you need to, put it in the other room. Open up your workbook and do everything that you can. What you don't want to do is to leave the grammar open and be going back and forth between the workbook and the grammar. That just means you're not going to be learning the, the grammar, okay? So get the grammar far away from you and focus on the workbook and do everything that you can. And if you forget a word or an ending or something, then just skip it and go to the next sentence in the exercise, okay? Uh, do all of the chapter, then go back, reread the grammar, Check your memory work, check your vocabulary, whatever you need to, and then come back and do the ones you couldn't do before, okay? But what you don't want to do is this flipping back and forth because it's just death. I mean, it's just death, okay? So uh, treat the workbook as a test, and uh, it'll you'll learn it. You can do this, all right? You can do this, all right? Well, have fun with this chapter.